Hello everyone, um, great to meet everyone. My name is Gaurav, I'm super excited about today's webinar. I'm gonna be joined by Liam Nolan, who's an awesome engineer. Um, this is our fifth episode of the Inside Track as well. So I'm super excited to host this and also to have on Liam Nolan today as well. Um, Liam is a multi-Grammy winning studio engineer um, who's worked with artists like Adele, Drake, Rihanna, Calvin Harris, AJ Tracy, Stormzy, and so many huge artists out there. Um, and it's going to be great because Liam's going to be sharing some awesome stuff with us today. Um, just to start off, if you have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A section. And, oh, let me just uh, go back there. Um, if you have any questions, please pop them into the Q&A section. Um, and also, if you're listening to us and watching us on our social feeds, please just drop your questions in and I will try answering them with Liam uh, during the session. Or we do have a Q&A section at the end as well. So I'm super excited for today's session. Um, and I'm going to ask Liam to maybe turn on his camera and come on, come on the thing. <laughs> How you doing, Liam? <laughs> I'm very good, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure oh. to be here, so... Oh, so honestly, I, I'm so excited. Today. I've known you for such a long time as well. Yeah. I was super excited to be able to do a webinar with you today. Oh. Um, and we have some awesome people around around the UK, I think, and, and the world watching today. So it's going to be awesome for you to actually give them some tips and tricks and how you got into the industry. Um, yeah. yeah, man. So I, I named some of the names there that you've worked with. Um, some huge names like Adele, AJ Tracy. And first of all, I just want to ask, who did you win the Grammys for? Was that Adele, right? So that that, that was with Adele, yeah. And that um, was tracking, wasn't it? A uh, recording, yeah. So um, that was for the album 25. And um, when she came here, she came here with a producer called Greg Kirsten. So they used our studio downstairs, Studio A where we recorded all a lot of the songs that he produced on that album. So it's for, for Adele. Wow, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. So I think, Liam, you'd be great at actually answering this question. So as you know, this is, yeah. um, this is the inside track, and I, I want to get to know a little bit more about what audio engineering is. And I try to ask a lot of, my, a lot of the guests that I, that I um, get on these webinars just to give a bit of a background. And, you, and as you work in Metropolis, which is one of the world's best studios, um and it's amazing even walking in there it's just like if, if i mean yeah. to the audience if you guys haven't had a chance to ever kind of record there or try i mean um you can book online right liam to do like yeah you can book online it's open yeah, yeah. to everybody not just the a-listers we're here to service everybody who wants to come record mix we're also quite a big master house so we've got loads of great master engineers we kind of try and provide a full package for everybody so yeah check out the website got amazing studios amazing people that work here amazing gear so yeah and it's a great experience i mean it's a very very good experience kind of like you know top of the top when it comes to production and i think it's just like even even writing there and just um just spending a couple hours there it's just so influential but yeah but absolutely the, the question that i had for you which i think you'd give a great answer for is um so audio engineering these days it covers so many different aspects right recording the assistant the mixing guy um can you name some of the few that either you've done or you 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 currently still do because i'm pretty sure it's just not just going in and just mixing you've got to set up the templates you've got to make sure things are done and of course um, yeah so before like with regards to setting up a session beforehand there's so much more that goes into it so um, normally uh, either myself or the student manager will get in touch with the producer artist will find out for example if we're doing vocals if they've got any specific vocal chain they like to use or if it's a larger tracking session kind of um, what they want to track whether that be drums bass guitars so beforehand we'll already have a lot of dialogue with the client to find out what sound they want um, you know what they're going after we'll then before the clients arrive, set everything up, make sure we've scratched all the mics, have our Pro Tools session ready, ready to go. So hopefully when the clients walk in, we're kind of good to go, you know, quick sound check, but make everything as easy and as smooth for them. So I think yeah. that's a lot of what audio engineer, engineering is, especially with the top clients, is just making everything smooth, easy, um, and not letting any of the technicalities get in the way of the creative side. So making sure everything's ready to go. We can quickly throw up whatever for them yeah. to try. Just making the session run smoothly, really. And, and, and in the real world, there, there probably a lot does happen where it's kind of like, oh, 
damn, this isn't working. And right in front of the person, and you kind of just got to like learn how to adapt and actually be ready, right? Of course, yeah, that comes, <laughs> that comes with experience, you know. Yeah. If there's if it's not a particular sound that they want, then, you know, in your bank of knowledge, you'll be, okay, maybe, you know, for example, this microphone might not be working. It might be too bright, so let's try a ribbon microphone. Or, you know, the sound's too dead. We want a bigger sound. Let's move this set up into the live room. So a lot of it comes with experience and just knowing what to, you know, how to approach a situation if it's not quite right, then to have a quick solution to, you know, to offer another alternative. Yeah. So... Yeah. yeah, no, that's a, that's a lot of it as well. But it's hopefully that doesn't ar arise too much because you already have had the conversation yeah. with the producer about what they're going for. And that's kind yeah. of like the um, something I said last week is like, like the artist has, um, you know, because I because I do a little bit of engineering myself. And one thing that I say is always like, as as an artist, I mean, I think I might have learned it from. I don't know if it was you or someone did tell me it, but like the artist should be warmed up before they come into the studio. But just like the engineer should be warmed up with mic selections and um yeah. session templates and everything it's a similar kind of thing right it's just being yeah. being so everyone is ready to go because if yeah, you're not, kind you've, of, got to be, you've got to be prepped for the session you can't you know the biggest vibe killer is you know a client walking in nothing <laughs> set up you don't know what's going on and it's like okay why have we booked this studio <laughs> yeah. you know you've got to be on top of your game ready to go at all times really yeah um, yeah again with dialogue beforehand and knowing what the session's going to entail really yeah yeah um all right liam so i want to yeah. I've, I've jumped a little bit far ahead but i want to go back a little bit now to to liam nolan and your career because obviously i haven't known you since i think the adele time is when i first met you yeah around just after that so um but i want to i want to know more about kind of like how how did you get there i mean i know i could imagine it wasn't an easy journey um it wasn't was it always something that you you know did you wake up at one point and go, you know what, I want to be, I want to be an audio engineer or did it kind of happen or did you go college, university or what were the steps to get to Metropolis? So I, for, for me, I think my route into the engineering world is, um, it's a bit more old school um, in the fact that I did go to university, but I didn't study audio engineering. I thought it'd be a career that was slightly out of my reach and, you know, it's quite a, small world so I really didn't think I'd be able to get into it but I went to university the subject I studied I wasn't really that interested in so I kind of did a hard reset and thought you know what I'll try and get into engineering because that's what I really love so um what what happened was initially during that first phase the the roundhouse in Camden is um a fantastic organization because they also have underneath the main venue they've got like a little um studio there you know practice rooms if you're under 25 at the time you could sign up for like 10 quid a year and go use their practice room wow so I signed up for that. I did a three-day training course in how to be a, a sound engineer. It was amazing, eye-opening, but, um, you know, it gave me my foot in the door. And then because they <clears throat> had strong links with the studio manager at the time, at the time, at that time, they then gave us a tour around Metropolis. And I was like, oh, my God, this is... <laughs> <laughs> this is the studio I was, sold. Sold. <laughs> I was sold that was it I, I knew I wanted to work there so yeah. immediately the next day I handed in my CV to Metropolis I was like I'll do anything I just want to come in so I started as a runner here with only my three days worth of experience wow. in studio <laughs> um, and it was a slow grind then because at that time you know you're just there to help facilitate anything in the building so I was literally making teas coffees you know cleaning wow. toilets whatever just to keep staying in the building um and with time and um got to know some of the engineers here so then they started um allowing me to sit in on sessions training me up as an assistant um so then that was a good number of years i was doing that five six years assisting wow. here and then a similar amount of time you know learning my craft as an engineer wow. so I've, I've started entirely from the bottom here at metropolis and learn everything on the job really which is wow that's a amazing bit more school. yeah i love that though because that's like you know when i was at uni and i actually did a music production course that's the story they did tell us <laughs> um <laughs> yeah. it's nice to hear someone actually go through that but go back yeah. a little bit so when you was an assistant what were your roles as an assistant at kind of one of the, the world's biggest studios 
um, what did you kind of like what the challenges that you might have faced and um, was it always kind of just setting up templates or setting up mics or was there kind of more to it that you thought well this is different yeah so the, the biggest thing actually so the role of an assistant is to one set up the studio make sure it's all working before the clients come in come in so that's setting up the microphones mm -hmm. scratching everything making sure it's all ready to go but the biggest thing that um i learned when i was assisting you know you can learn all the technical side of it as you go but especially in a studio like metropolis where you're dealing with a-listers um the big thing that i think the engineers at the time were looking for was more of the hospitality side of it mm. so you know if you you know you're there to get everything set up but then make the session run smoothly make everything feel everybody feel comfortable kind of try and troubleshoot so if somebody says okay i'm thinking about recording a guitar you know you'll whisper into the engineer's ear okay what should we have set up just in case this happens and it's your job to go and you know set it up just in case anything happens and make again make sure it all runs smoothly so mm -hmm. you know i think that's the big part of being an assistant is just sitting at the back not really being that you know noticeable but just keeping your eyes on everything that's going on and trying to stay one step ahead and make sure everything runs smoothly really it's like just being just being ready kind of for for anything yeah. that might come your way right because obviously as, as as the engineer they're probably really focused on getting everything done in, in the short space of time that they might have Absolutely. um awesome man i mean and then, then you went from the assistant straight into an engineer um and then you worked with i guess would you be given kind of like more smaller clients or was it straight in to any aliases <laughs> well well <laughs> Uh, normally they kind of ease you into it. So you do start off with smaller artists, less high pressure, you know, um, sessions. But I, I guess my big break where when I started to engineer, I kind of landed on a really good uh, session. So at the time I started doing some downtime for a band called Clean Bandit, <laughs> which was that's um, nice, <laughs> which, which was all good, um, and that was just with their strings section. So I got to know Grace, and then um, then when they came in with an actual booking, um, they obviously requested me to engineer. And the wow. first, I guess, really big breakthrough engineering gig, gig I did was Rather Be. That was kind of the one that wow kind of announced okay i'm now an engineer yeah, i'm an engineer now <laughs> yeah well kind of i was you know still at the time still, once you know that did well it kind of gave me a bit more confidence where i was like okay i can now transition a bit quicker from assisting to engineering wow yeah, so, that's yeah. mad yeah, i mean it was exciting. That, that kind of leads me on to now and you know i was gonna ask this how was it working with adele that was a, that's a big one um yeah it was it, it was amazing it, it She's super lovely. As yeah. you see her on TV, that's how mm -hmm. she is. But that session is actually very different from a lot of the other sessions because when she came in to record here, um, that was, again, still quite... So when did that album come out? 2016? Yeah. So she was writing with Greg Kirsten a year or two before. So that was actually still in my transition phase from assisting to engineering so I was initially wow. actually put on as an assistant to Greg um because it was initially just going to be a writing session see what happens right. so we had um a setup day beforehand where Greg was like actually we're going to need the piano set up we're going to need some drums guitars bass so it was a full band tracking session and he plays everything because he's an amazing multi-instrumental wow. so it kind of turned out that you know you know it was more engineering you ended up being a bit yeah. more engineering um although every it, and what was really interesting about that was he because it's Adele was running everything into his laptop so he had four inputs um one and two were for the so the drums was a sub mix on the desk going mm -hmm. to one and two same with the piano um guitars and bass going into input three mono and then Adele's vocal four. So wow. what was quite interesting was, you know, the piano was a sub mix, you know, of the close mics, the rooms, same with the drums. So it was a bit different in that fact that it wasn't fully multi-tracked. Yeah. Yeah. 
Wow. Which and is I mean, a testament to him, you know. And, and how was it like, obviously, hearing hearing her live? Because obviously, she's very powerful. There's a lot of emotion there. And obviously, when you're trying to work and hear that live, I mean, I'd be sidetracked. I'd be like, wait, what? <laughs> um, yeah, so how was it kind yeah. of like being in that room? I mean, yeah, she's, she's amazing. Again, I'm not even going to lie for a lot of it once they were rocking and everything was working into Greg's, so I would just pop in. So a lot of the time, once they got the sound, I would leave them to it, come mm-hmm. in if they needed to change anything, mic anything else up. But a lot of the time, because, again, it was writing. Yeah. A lot of the time I wasn't in the room. I'm not going to lie. It was just mm-hmm. them doing their thing, which, yeah. again, is part of, you know, if 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 clients don't want you there, you've just got to make sure you're, everything you've set up and done is ready for them just Working. to use and make it easy for them. So, yeah, you know, yeah. It's, it's how it was. It's, but that was the session, really. And that's it. And then the, the other one that is probably, I think your latest one would be AJ Tracy, right? Um, yeah. Who is, uh, for those, I mean, a lot of you must know who AJ Tracy is, but if anyone's listening internationally, AJ Tracy is probably definitely one of my favourite UK artists. Um, absolutely amazing. I think his flow and his... Just a yeah. different, I mean, Liam, you could probably say the same thing, but I think it's just, he's so different to what's out there, right? When it comes to the UK. Um, yeah, it's amazing. And it's- I weirdly, had, I'd met him at, um, we have a thing called Carnival, and I met him there once before he blew, and on just off Labrick Grove, and uh, yeah. he was just such a nice guy. And I could tell that his personality is exactly the same. <laughs> absolutely, uh, absolutely. He's an absolute dude. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So lovely. <laughs> And yeah. what did you what did you do with AJ then? Was it more tracking or mixing then, Liam? So that was tracking. So he would come here to cut all his vocals, so recording mm-hmm. the songs, a lot of writing. And he's a real special artist because the speed at which he can write is obscene. He's the right. quickest guy I've seen writing lyrics and bars. He is so quick. So when we're on a session. It's normally, you know, he'll have his producer, Nige, there and a couple of others. They'll be making beats. Again, Nige is fantastic. He can knock up a beat in like 20 minutes and it sounds wow. sick. <laughs> then AJ will write to that. So within like a six, seven hours, we could have recorded four songs. You know, they're that cool. same. Yeah, he's, he's a different beast. He's an animal. He's amazing. Workflow. <laughs> yeah. That is workflow, isn't it? I mean... Actually, just on that point, I mean, how important is kind of having a, a, like a so-called engine running there? Like, you know, I've I've heard a lot about writers and producers kind of like the art. So the artist, someone's making a beat here. Um, then they get passed into the engineer. The engineers work with the uh, artist directly. The yeah. producer's got headphones on working on the next track. That, that cycle's yeah. just insane. But then you get people who just work directly as like, like obviously, w- with the pandemic, it was obviously really difficult. Everything was getting sent through through yeah through the cloud, I guess. Um, so, kind of, how important is it to have this engine of kind of like production, writing, engineering, and um, you know, getting stuff done really quickly? Yeah, I think taking your time, I guess. Yeah, I I, I think it's a there's a difference between rushing and being efficient so i think you've got yeah. to be as efficient as possible and for you know it doesn't matter if you're a big client with a big budget or a small smaller independent artist with maybe not so much budget the thing that especially coming into a studio like this is maximizing your time and making it as efficient as you can be because then you're getting the most value for your money really so that these guys know okay they're going to come in do their thing, get as much down. And, you know, I think that's a really good productive way to approach approach sessions in studios, really, is to kind of be prepared and try and maximise your time, really, and get the most done. Yeah. It's so true. No, it's so true. It's kind of like finding that balance, isn't it? It's like you don't want to rush it, but you also want to kind of get it going as well. So it's kind of finding the vibe and you know, keep things rolling over. The The biggest kind of vibe killer is when something goes wrong or, you know, there's a lull in the moment. So once people are, you know, feeling creative, you've got to try and keep that going for as long as possible. Yeah. And yeah. I think that it's, it's quite true because even when you when I'm watching those videos on YouTube about engineers um, and they, you can see a lot, they are quite a vibe, right? 
they're there to give yeah. that, and just to make the artists feel really comfortable. Yeah. And um, I mean, even now when I when I mean when I walk through Metropolis let's say, and I speak to everyone, everyone is so welcoming and you know they want to talk to you. And I think that's so important as an engineer. It's just to allow the artists to be as creative as they can and um, yeah. let them do the creative work while you do the technical stuff, basically. Yeah, exactly. One hundred percent. And and yeah, it's all about keeping. I feel like. A vibe but staying calm really yeah i think that's a big part of it is you know you've got to um yeah just not let what you're doing get in the way of what they're doing so even if like pro tools crashes you know or or the computer shuts down or there's a noise on the channel you know it's not to let that show like oh you know oh no yeah. something's gone wrong here it's just be like cool give us a moment yeah grab a tea coffee we'll get it all sorted you know it's it's how it is you've, you've got to maintain the calmness for, mm-hmm. for everybody so and, true. Be, and, and you know you can be in the studio for 12 plus hours a day for weeks on end with you know the client so you've got to be able to you know be calm enough and cool enough to sit there and just keep everything ticking over i think keep that's going. a big part of it yeah yeah it's you know how you handle the session and how you handle yourself i think that's a big part of engineering definitely and and liam how was it um obviously when when the pandemic happened in the uk you guys had to adapt to working in a different way right yeah um and obviously a-list artists were still needing to record because obviously they'd still be touring eventually and they got stuff to do and albums to finish so obviously, yeah. how could you briefly explain how that was was for you guys? Because I, m- I remember when I rang you as well during that time, and I was like, "How's it going, man? You guys still open?" And yeah, um, it'd be nice to know because obviously you guys did adapt really quickly, right? Yeah. So all throughout, we followed the government guidance yeah. on um, how business should operate during the pandemic. But we were actually quite lucky in the fact that our main rooms are quite big, so we had everything taped up individual zones i think um we stayed open um well we closed for a little bit a month right at the start because we weren't sure what was going on but once the government guidance came out we opened back up um but we had limited numbers of people who could actually attend so normally that'll be the artist producer and that's it and all the studio was zoned off so okay the artist over here producer over here engineer here and that's that's it really so we ran small attended sessions but a big game changer came from um streaming sessions really so there was quite a few sessions where if i had a mix here um rather than the client attending there's an amazing uh, company called audio movers where you can stream your mix session so we had a lot of kind of similar similar to this zoom meetings yeah. streaming mix sessions I also did um, a session for a client at their their home, but I was logged in um, to their laptop at home, running their Pro Tools and recording wow. their, you know, <laughs> which was pretty mad. So again, through audio movers, I was listening, but running the Pro Tools session. Wow. Yeah, which was pretty mad. But it was, wow. a good, it was crazy how quickly people adapted, really. And, you know... I think a lot of it now is less reason for, say, if you've got a producer over in the States and an artist here, it's now proved that rather than flying over, you can easily just stream the mm-hmm. session, get them up on talkback, you know, have Zoom running. So it's almost, it's still not the same, but almost like having them here and, you know, their input being instantaneous and they're hearing back instantaneous what's going on. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The way the pandemic shaped that was pretty crazy and how quickly yeah. everybody adapted to that. I agree, crazy. yeah. I mean, seeing sessions yeah. being done virtually was just remarkable because now yeah. you listen to some of the songs that are out, you're like, wow, that was done all via like Zoom and audio. Yeah. Um, exactly. And it just got people thinking of how they can adapt stuff. And I think it was it was so good for innovation. I was just like, wow, this is mad. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> New ways to do it. Um, last question before we head over to your session. Um, yeah. What's your two favourite piece of gear at Metropolis that you could not live without? <laughs> oh, sorry, Grav, you cut out there. What oh, was the question so, again? So what are the two, um, what are your top two favourite pieces of gear in Metropolis that you just could not mix or record without? Oh, I know it's a hard one. That is a good one. 
So I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to pick a microphone or microphones, really. Okay. So if I if I if I had to have one microphone to do everything, um, it would be a U67, probably. Ooh. But for vocals, I love the Sony C800. So Ooh. there. Um, of course we run Pro Tools, so we need to have Pro Tools. That is like the <laughs> essential thing we've got to have. So we've got to have Pro Tools. Um, I can't work as nearly as quickly in, in, in any other door, so definitely <laughs> Pro Tools. Um, if I had to have one compressor, maybe, um, oh, it's a tough one. 1176 probably, or the Tutec CL1B, I don't know. Can I have both? Ooh. You can have both. <laughs> Definitely have both. Um, I, I think that's amazing. I mean, yeah. the the, um, the CLB is absolutely amazing. Yeah. So. The, it's the workhorse of <laughs> yeah. Um, even the so recently, I've been trying out the soft tube version because you can use it with carbon. So I've been using that yeah. out as well, and it just sounds so so yeah. crisp. Um, control for, especially for vocals controlling yeah. the dynamic it's like the one really yeah um get that dialed in well liam that's me done with my questions um yeah. and i think we're gonna we're gonna get a little bit of an insight of your session um, yeah so i'd I like to show two things because a lot of what i do is like working with uh rappers and vocalists i thought i'd show you my pro tools template on mm -hmm. how i uh work with that and then if we've got time, I'd qu quick, quite like to show how um, uh, a thing that really changed the game for me was how I do my automation, mixing automation in Pro Tools and really speed that up. Because I know yeah. there's loads of videos on mixing, but a thing that really can make your mix pop is automation. So I'd like to show that yeah. as well. So Definitely. Um, I'm just going to squidge over here because I've got yep. my Pro Tools rig. So hopefully... Uh, hopefully. And if anyone has any questions for Liam, uh, please just pop them in and we will definitely get to them uh, yeah. in this session as well. I'm excited to ask Liam a few more a bit later. But yeah, just drop them in the Q&A, guys, and um, we'll come to them soon. So, so Liam, this is your vocal template. This is my right? vocal template, indeed. And, wow. <laughs> and although it's, it's actually really simple, I think I've run a pretty simple no fuss kind of template um pardon me um so the first thing i've got to say is obviously when recording vocals i try and pick the right unless the uh, if the artist has a specific vocal chain we'll use that if not i'll try and pick a mic and a chain that suits the voice so normally it'll be either u67 c800 we've got um down here you can't see but we've got a neve 1073 preamp i like to use and i normally just filter off 50 hertz rumble and then i'll either go into a tube tech cl1b or 1176 and that's my vocal chain um and with the compressor when i'm recording i'm probably um uh not doing more than like 5 dB gain reduction max on the really loud bits. I just want to control it, but leave options for, um, you know, the producer or whoever at the end of it. I may go a little bit harder if I know I'm going to mix it myself. So, but when you're sending vocals off, you're not sure who it's going to. I like to leave a bit of headroom for people to add their own processing. So once I've got the vocals all good, I'll explain again, it's super simple. Um, I think it might, it might not be, but how I run my vocals. So here, um, first of all, my AVOX is where all my lead vocals go to basically. Um, and I've, I've found that a lot of artists like to hear back in their monitors a, a finished, polished sounding vocal. Um, in their cans. So all my uh, vocal tracks here will go to my AVOX bus. Wow. And here I have some processing DSP plugins from um, uh, Plugin Alliance because it's DSP low, you know, is the latency is not so high. So you can really kind of use plugins to sculpt. So here if I, I have a TLA, Summit Audio T TLA 100, and that's just, again, doing a couple dBs kind of where 
uh, gain reduction. I blend less or more depending how much. But for a lot of the really kind of rap guys, um, they like a lot of compression on their vocals. So this one's the one where I'm really kind of giving it a bit more welly to really lock in, you know, the vocals. So that's an 1176 style compressor, uh, slow attack, uh, quick release. Um, it's kind of, yeah, just to really pin and hold the lead vocal. Then I, I, underneath I have my EQ and this is uh, EQ based on the GML um, 8200 parametric EQ, the hardware version. And again, I'm just filtering some low end, uh, quite a bit of top end there, but that depending on the voice. Again, that's to bring out the presence, make it brighter for their cans. Um, obviously, if once you're doing kind of all that, the, the Compression EQ, you're going to need a de mm -hmm. um, And then I've got an SSL channel strip at the end. And this is just the final finishing touches, really. I don't really touch this. It'll be in or out. But if somebody says, oh, okay, can I just, I don't know, a bit more compression, or you hear, you know, you may need to duck a bit of mids. That's just my final finishing touch, really. And that's all these plugins are just to add the finishing touches to make it sound more finished in their cans even though the signal one recordings a lot more um natural and got a lot more headroom with regards to compression and then you know, so that's my lead vocal bus i'll have the same for my bvs down here a b vox i'll normally record my bvs on here and same with my c vox or they double up because sometimes you a lot of the time you may not know who's coming into the session. So these can double up as like guest vocal buses. So they're oh, wow. kind of multi-purpose, if that makes sense. It could be for BVs or if there's a couple of extra people laying vocals, then this will become their vocal uh, bus. And for, especially for like the, the rap guys, I normally have a record track where say, you know, we'll do all my lead vocal recordings. I'll record that, do another take. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And then if they're happy with that, I would then um, drag that down, you know, to there and then record afterwards. And that's kind of how you stitch together, um, you know, your lead vocals, whatever that will become. Right. Does that make sense? How you kind of. It's that's a very quick way of working. I really like that. That's very quick. Yeah. Um, the question that I've got, Liam, is so just going back a little bit, you said obviously some artists may come in with their own chain. Um, yeah. but obviously I'm a I'm a I'm a huge fan of UK rap and US rap, right? Yeah. Um, have you ever had do you find a difference as an engineer, obviously, and, and, and you worked with a, a lot of US guys as well, right? When they come down yeah. Yeah, and stuff like that. Um, yeah. have you found that they are different when it comes to their chain? compared to kind of more the UK guys? Uh, not so much, to be fair. Again, if okay. they're providing their own vocal template, it's going to be a variation on this, but the plugins will be aiming for the same thing, you know? So, again, there'll be quite a lot of compression, especially with the UK, uh, mm -hmm. US rap guys, you know, top end. Normally, you know, you'd depending, you'd have auto-tune, running um you know there's not a huge amount of difference it's just their their preferences on plugins really to achieve that yeah but yeah. they'll normally have the kind of lead vocal bus bv bus you mm. know it's, it's similar uh, it works and then okay. again for like my effects i have them right at the bottom but i nice. keep it super simple i don't have too much um going on so on, on the aux, I'll have my effect sense, so that's going to oh, my, nice. my delay for the lead vocals. And it's super simple, Valhalla, vintage verb. Um, that will be my reverb. I'll change the decay, well, reverb time, depending on the session. Mm -hmm. My pre-delay is at naught because, um, oh, I can't, I can't uh, see, but here, I take the delay comp off because sometimes that adds latency. So that essentially taking the delay comp off essentially becomes my pre-delay, but it doesn't really matter for reverb. Um, 
Yeah, and then again, it's super simple, standard Pro Tools delay if they want it. If they want a bit of chorus, so I have a chorus. Nice. And then these are like my extra, so say they want a, a reverb throw on the end of a word or delay throw, I've got these two vocal buses set up so I can just quickly add it and, you know, send the odd word to it for a reverb throw. And, you know, I try and keep it as simple really as possible you know nothing too nothing too crazy yeah going on because you need to keep on top of it all i think simplicity is is key man i think sometimes um pe people tend to just over process or just slap so much stuff in because they've seen it on youtube or they've seen it somewhere or, you know they, they want to copy it but i think just hearing you kind of talk through that process yeah it's simple but it it, it does what you need to do and that's the main yeah. thing um yeah. you know it's yeah i think that's really cool and I, I i really love the way that you were kind of recording vocals drop them down recording vocals drop them down i think that's so yeah. so quick um yeah. and it also means that if you've got one record track say for your lead vocals you know you can always go back i have every new take i playlist mm -hmm. so you've got all the you know takes there you can go back you can comp it's all yeah. just in one place you know you leave both same for your bvs i'll start recording them on their own mm -hmm. you know track so you've got all the bv takes ready wow to bump if you want to but this is this is golden stuff man <laughs> okay. i love I, this it should it should in my opinion it shouldn't be too complicated yeah really. <laughs> easy to see easy to navigate know where everything is yeah, yeah. So, and then once you've recorded it, so actually, um, this is yeah, one of my questions. Um, so once you have recorded the vocalist, or before you've recorded the vocalist, would you ask for kind of stems, or do you go off a two track and then get the stems for the mixing session? Um, entirely depends. Okay. Um, if I'm going to be mixing it, then I'll ask for the stems, and then you'll pop them in here. Yeah, I would either pop them in here, or depends, or if it's going to be purely vocal tracking, then. A two tracks fine, you yeah. know. You don't need anything more than that, yeah. Really to track to. So yeah. and most of the time, to be fair, it's a two track they provide. This is yeah. instrumental. Let's track to that. Then, if you know you're mixing it later, you can get the stems and import them into this session and line it all up. But and then you back time. And then, would you pop this session then into another into your mixing template and then start mixing this into there, or would you bring? The stems of the track is here. Either, either or, really. Okay. Okay. Um, so if if I'm mixing it, I'd make sure my two track and my stems start at the same place. So you could mm -hmm. either import your stems into this, or you could make a new session, mix session, and import session data of your mm -hmm. vocals, and it should all line up. So nice. And chances are, if I'm mixing it, I'll probably make a new session. So I would import session data. Of yeah. all my vocals into the new session, so this is kind of kept as a clean, right? Okay, session, and then there's a separate mix session. Yeah, um, right, man. Cool. I mean, I think yeah. I, I I definitely want to get you on your second session because I'm excited to hear about your automation. Um, yeah. So should we load that one up for ten minutes and then we can go on some of the yeah. questions that are coming in, Liam? Absolutely. So it's yeah. a super quick one, but I think it'll be really handy um to people who are mixing on pro tools because it was the one thing that really sped up my automation so it's a quick one but it's a really good little tip i think so two seconds i'll just boot that up so let me open vc okay so this is like a fake mix session essentially so um so the first thing I want to show you is to the way I do it is right at the beginning of my mix session is a couple um, uh, preferences that I have to select. And I think you can only do this in Pro Tools Ultimate, but I'm not too sure if the preview function works in uh, normal Pro Tools, but I'll show you anyway. So imagine this is your mix. You've loaded it up. If I go to my preferences, um, so mixing straight away, I'll put plugin controls default to auto enabled and coalesce trim to manual. That's just so I can see what I'm doing. 
So imagine I'm mixing. This is my mix. I've got my balance. I'm going to add some plugins. So let's add, um, let's add a compressor. Let's add an EQ. Okay. So I'm mixing, and I've got a static balance. I've tweaked all my compressors, my EQs. But once I've got my static balance, I now want to make movement in the session or change things up. So with Pro Tools, if you do Command 4, you can bring up this automation window. And this shows you um, what you can automate, what's enabled to. But this is the genius bit, is this preview automation button down here, which allows you to change your mix, your plugins, um, without, so you can change multiple things and A, B between your current mix and your tweet mix. So for example, say I've got, um, this is my static balance here for my verse, but now I want to change um, my balance for my chorus and my EQ compression settings. Um, with preview, you know, you can, um, in fact, sorry, I've got a step ahead of myself here. So I do all my automation in trim, so I can see what I'm doing, and you've got to put it in latch. So now when I'm changing my fader balance with preview in, for example, okay, in the chorus, the kick needs to come up, the snare needs to come up, maybe the bass is a bit boomy, let's bring my guitars up for a bit more punch and my vocals up. As you can see here, it's all turned to green, which means I'm previewing the automation, but it's not writing. So when I command click my preview, you can ah. aim between your tweet mix and your wow. um, static balance. And, it, and the same applies with your EQ. So, okay, let's go to my um, guitar. So in this chorus bit, okay, I want a bit more top end now and let's maybe um, roll off some of the bottom. For example, I'm just, you know, freestyling here a little bit, but okay, let's a bit more compression. Oh, did I do that? Not with preview, <laughs> but uh, okay. So let me start again. So with previewing, you know, you add a bit of top end, change your compression settings, Again, so you can really sculpt the mix. So when I A, B, you know what oh. I mean? You can tweak a whole bunch of things. At once. At one, <laughs> A, B it. And then what's genius about it, so say I've got this now new balance for my chorus. I think that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, if I go to Wave Trim, so you can see the, uh, uh, the automation being written. So say here, I've got all of this now, it's fantastic. I'll capture what I've done and I'll write the automation to that bit. And it's written the automation for that section. Wow. They all want to do the same for the second chorus. So I can just click here, you know, and then write that there um, and then write it there. So That's do you know what I mean? It's like a yeah. really quick way of trying things out and really, sculpting your mix really quickly because when I first started mixing I didn't know about this feature so I'd be like okay in a chorus I need to push up the guitar so with my mouse I'd push up the guitars only mm -hmm. I'm like, okay now I probably need to push up the bass but this allows you to do a whole bunch of stuff wow. very quickly um, and yeah you can fly through automating a mix using this so that's kind that's, of how I... that's such a gem that's a that's a really good um, tip yeah, because I think there's loads of videos on how to mix, but the thing that really makes mixes um, come alive is all these kind of moves and, you know, ch changing the dynamics and relationships mm -hmm. between stuff. So I think if there's a good way of, well, this is the best way of doing it that I've found, you know, where you can really make your mixes super dynamic really quickly mm -hmm. um, using this method. It goes down again yeah. to, to efficiency, isn't it? It's just like Absolutely. it's efficient, it works, it does the job, and um, you get a bit of extra time at the end because you've, you've, you've been quick with it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And, you know, your ears aren't being tied because you've just done 20 mix, you know, little 
mixed chain oh, yeah. within a, <laughs> a minute. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. your efficiency goes up super quick. So no, definitely. Yeah. That's my little mix tip. All right, Liam. Well, thank you, man. Was it? Oh, was there anything else that you wanted to show? Um, or yeah. was that it? Was it? Was there one more? No, no. So I think no? that I think that was that was it. Yeah, that was it. Okay, cool. <laughs> That's all right. Obviously, I mean that was amazing. That was. Uh, a, I think I've already had someone uh, comment about the automation preview as well. So that's awesome. What I'm going to do then, Liam, is I'm going to bring up some questions um, yeah. from people around, around our uh, social feeds and, and the Q&A over here as well. Uh, we'll spend 15 minutes on these questions. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, go to the first one from Julian. Um, great chat and vibes. I'm an assistant editor looking to develop my audio music mixing skills. Any tips or materials you'd recommend? Oh, tips to develop mixing skills. Well, I mean, there's so many resources now. Um, I guess, first of all, the biggest tip I can say is just practice it. Practice makes perfect. So you can, you can watch as many videos, but you've really just got to do it yourself and, you know, try out. So keep practicing your mixing. Amazing resources like uh, a free resource that I use all the time. I'm a big fan of Dave Pensado. So I'm always watching his YouTube, Pensado's Place, uh, Into the Lair, he's always doing mix tips. There's, um, you know, other resources such as Mix with the Masters. You have to pay for that, but you've got the top mix yeah. engineers in the world giving a breakdown on their mixing process, which is super invaluable. And yeah, you, YouTube. Honestly, the amount of stuff I've learned off YouTube all made me think differently. Um, you know, if I'm not sure... Okay, for example, you know, I'm really struggling to get a lot of low end out of my 808. I'll just search in YouTube like 808 low end tips yeah. and, you know, get thousands, a lot, you know, of videos on that. So honestly, I still use YouTube. For the most YouTube time. is, yeah, it's such a, um, it's always yeah. going to be one of the best kind of things, isn't it? Because it's free, yeah. it's always there, it's accessible. Um, and there is so much content on there. Absolutely. Like I search anything and everything that I've got a problem with. I think the other day I, I broke my iron and I was trying to fix it. And I was like, let me just <laughs> yeah, Google YouTube. it. Let me just go on YouTube and try and see if anyone can <laughs> help me fix this iron. Um, exactly. Anyway, so I think that was awesome. That's such a good answer. I mean, mixed with the masters, especially, it's just yeah. like, um, you know, that's their stuff is just absolutely amazing, isn't it? It's just yeah, really in depth, detailed. Absolutely. Um, and then, so the next one is from um, one of our avid specialists, Simon, yeah. <laughs> um, mm. which is awesome. Um, so, yeah, great question, actually. But how do you feel about Atmos and spatial audio? So has it yeah. changed the recording and mixing workflow for you? Because I know you guys have a room now in Metropolis. Yeah. Right? Awesome. So At Atmos, yeah, I've, I've been delving into Atmos and it's a really interesting um, space, really. So it's... To begin with, it's a bit of a like, well, what's going on here? Because you're now visualizing, well, spatializing the mix in a in, in a room. So that that took a bit of getting used to. But to be fair, once you kind of know the groundworks and how it all works, you know, it's super seamless with Pro Tools. It's really easy. You kind of figure out just by doing it, for example, where you should place the drums. Yeah where you should place, you know, your lead vocals. It becomes very intuitive and it's amazing really how intuitive you guys have made um, mixing in Atmos. Yeah. And but the real exciting thing that I think will happen and I'm hoping will happen is when you start approaching the recording process with Atmos in mind. Wow. So we've already done one session where we had a vocalist, um, a uh, guy playing the piano and a guy playing the violin and we mic'd it up as if you know you're now treating that recording as the room so the piano you obviously had your close mics but you had some mics for the height you had some mics for the you know far away wow. for the depth of the room so when you start approaching recording with Atmos in mind that's when it becomes really mind-blowing and kind of really gives I mean makes use of that in extra dimension you know yeah i mean even like uh the other day when so it's a funny story but um the first time i really was the kind of more of the listener 
Um, because the other day I was on a plane, I was on a plane going to Spain, but I forgot to download all the normal music. But I downloaded the, the Atmos um, playlist. So I was like, "Wow, this is this is gonna be crazy!" And I was blown away. I was just sitting there and I was like, "This actually sounds." Yeah. You end up really questioning about audio and like, "Wow, whoa, yeah. where did that <laughs> come from?" Um, no, it's amazing. I love it. The whole binaural stuff is amazing. All that does it's so good. And the I think that. It- no, sorry, the fact that, you know, it kind of gives back some more dynamics into the music where compared to your stereo kind of makes things mm-hmm. more yeah. exciting, if, if that makes I sense. Agree. That back in. Yeah. So, yeah I, I, I see it as like technology is moving so much. Otherwise, it's just it's about time that we move with audio now as well. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I'm really excited for kind of 2022 for audio because it's yeah. going to be really cool. Um, I've got a few more questions, Liam. So this is from Mike. Um so Liam, how do you create space in your mix without losing the fullness of your sounds, especially with regards to percussion? I struggle to keep sounds feeling full and still clear, punchy, and still yeah. clear, punchy on top of other sounds. So, so that's a very good question. It depends, but I find to get everything still clear and punchy, um, I once I've initially got say my vocals in my drums I very rarely solo any source after that if that makes sense only to check maybe like if there's something weird to check but the key to mixing is really keeping everything in the mix so you can hear how things are interacting whether say for example if you're struggling with your percussion then you know chances are it, it, there may be stuff in the if you've got drums that may be masking it so you don't solo your percussion make them sound good don't solo your drums to make them sound good mix them together and try and figure out where things might be masking to try and create that extra space because it's all mixing is all about figuring out the relationship between your different elements and making space for them. So I guess my biggest tip is really just to listen to everything in context and critically listen to see what may be masking a particular source that isn't cutting through and try and rectify that, whether with EQ, compression or or anything like that, really. That's a great, great answer. And and should people be mixing into a limiter, would you say? Is it is it great to have a lim- limiter on or... Not well, really. Sorry, you can't. Oh, sorry. Did you lose me? Oh, um, is it? W- would you say mixing into a limiter is a good thing? Um, kind of on your mix bus, or would you rather not? Oh, that's. A... <laughs> that, by the way, that was one of mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> At the tail end of that question, there, I was like, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mix with my mix bus in and my limiting in um, now? Nice. And the reason. The reason I do that is because um, once you kind of got a feel of what your mix bus is doing, you know, where you, it becomes kind of intuitive. So, you know, okay, if I'm going to be pushing my kick up, you know, my compressor should be hitting at this particular amount of gain reduction. It becomes very much mixing into your mix bus mm. to get your sound. You know, and when I take it on and off, it's not doing a huge amount. It is adding stuff, obviously, yeah. but you know, I just find it easier to get a bit more consistent mixes when I when I'm mixing into something. If that right. makes sense, because yeah. it, all, it kind of almost becomes like my gain staging because yeah. I know that if I'm pushing too hard into it, my mix is probably a bit too loud. So right. I kind of know where the sweet spot of what my compressor should be doing. Um, in my mix bus so that's why i mix with it in because okay. yeah again it just speeds up <laughs> the work yeah no, that's true it's efficiency again right <laughs> it's all about efficiency um, and saving your ears yeah then the next one we've got is um opinions so it's from christopher it's opinions on limiting and loud slash loudness do you think crushing dynamics has a desirable sound in some cases whether it's using a single component or groups this is less for from a mastering perspective and more from a mix perspective. Ooh, that's a good question. I mean, yeah, limiting, you shouldn't be afraid of limiting. As I said, it's all about using your ears. So if it's adding some, you know, even if it's really crushing it, keeping it, but if it's adding excitement and adding to your mix, then I don't see a problem with it. You know, um, 
I and, and if it's used in that creative way, then absolutely go for it. I, I have zero problems with it. The only, you know, the back end of it though, if you're sending your mix and it's printed through a limiter and it's really slammed, really crushed, and that's obviously given less headroom for the mastering engineer. So that I would suggest maybe backing off a little bit. But if it's used creatively and adding to the sound, then I'm all for it. I don't think there are any rules really. So mm -hmm. yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. I think that answers that one. Um the next one is could you talk about what software and techniques you use uh, to create a really good low end baseline? Um, Moresco UK scene like a drill 808. So I think maybe just yeah. how you'd create a really nice or how you'd shape the base. Uh, <laughs> so guess. especially with like um, 808 stuff, if it's really subby, um, well, there's, there's, I see it as like two components really. Mm -hmm. So with the 808, you've got like the sub, but then you've also got the higher frequencies, which should be the stuff that cuts through in your mix. Yeah. So if I, I first of all will um, slightly distorts, not, not the right word, but try and get some harmonic saturation coming through. I don't know if you can see in the back there, we've got some NS tens, which yep. have terrible low ends. So if I can hear my, um, 808 coming through there wow. by adding a bit of harmonics, then I know it's going to cut through in every speaker. So that's the first thing, thing I'm mm -hmm. looking for. Then I'm also looking to tidy up the low end. I was, uh, let me see if I can go back to my protocols. I'll show mm -hmm. you um, I'll share screen again. And it's pretty important to have like like a set of reference speakers beside you, right? Like just a, yeah. um, a small, I mean, again, you could even, do techniques like use audio movers and send it to your mobile phone and go to another room and listen to what Absolutely. your mix sounds like, right? Um, but like a really good uh, technique to get, you know, you've got like um, in UAD things like Voice of God, which is, um, does something, I, I don't quite know <laughs> how to explain, but <laughs> here like uh, resonant filtering. So with your, 808s normally you have loads of information down yeah. there that's 150, but some of it you might not necessarily need. So a good way is to find the sweet spot of where your subs are really kicking by putting a filter, but then adding this little notch of resonant filter. Right. And then sweeping up. So you're getting rid of all the mud that's not necessary, but finding where your subs really punching through. And just wow. doing that, honestly, you'll find that your subs become fatter, but without all the weird mm. gumph down here. You can normally find a sweet spot. So I'd normally do that, find the sweet spot for my 808. Then in Pro Tools, you know, you've got like an amazing lo-fi is my favorite. Oh, yeah. <laughs> ever. So again, maybe add a bit of distortion, a bit of such, you know, blend it to taste reads to make sure that it's cutting through if that information isn't there. But yeah, that's how I kind of get my AOHs to really punch through is yeah. using the technique to get rid of gumph, but find the sweet spot for where your subs are really, really kicking. Cool. I love yeah. that. I've never seen that. It's really, really cool. You've given a lot today, Liam. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> um and then, so the last question we've got here is from Amit from, from on on our YouTube um, channel, which is: yeah. with Apple Music going lossless, um, are we all going to record at one nine two kilohertz? Is it worth it? One nine two. Do you know what? <laughs> In my <laughs> opinion, it's not that worth it because the amount of information and file size compared to what your um, recording 192 seems in my opinion a little bit extreme um because the resolution is far beyond like your 20 kilohertz is going crazy yeah. of that top end which you can't perceive so you're essentially adding extra information to your file that's not right. even going to perceive but i can see going up to like 96 kilohertz you know being more of a thing as computers get more powerful more hard drive space i don't see why you know you wouldn't go up to those kind of sample rates but here at metropolis um i've got to say the majority of sessions are still recorded at 48 wow. you know just for 
to give you, you know, your computer being solid, your track count, you know, file sizes, you know, a big importance to people. They don't want to be downloading, you know, massive sessions. So 48 mm. seems to be the standard. But as things get better, I can see it going higher to 96. But 192, I've never recorded anything at 192. And um, maybe in the future, I don't know. But at the moment, it's kind of... I don't know anybody that's doing it at that high sample rate. Okay. Well, I hope uh, that answers your question, Amit. Anyway, Liam, that comes to the end of uh, today's webinar. Um, thank you. So we've probably got 110 things still to talk about, but thank you so much for sharing kind of such no, important stuff. Um, it's always an honor to have people like yourself on, on our series and sharing gems with us and just, just, yeah, talking about their career. Um, it's been awesome. And thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's been Cheers, a Liam. pleasure. Cheers, thank ma'am. Um, Cheers. All right, guys, I'm going to oh, just um, show you next week session as well, which we have going on. Uh, thanks for tuning in, everyone, today. It's been awesome. Um, next week, we have, we have the inside track, um, creative editing with Una. So, guys, please scan the QR code. That's Tuesday, the 30th of November at 3 p.m. BST, 4 p.m. CEST. Um, please join us next week. And thank you so much for listening today. My name is Gaurav and I will see you all soon. Take care.